The Third Eye by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read to you by Blue Friend Chapter 4 At the Temple Gates The road led straight ahead to Chakpuri Lamasari, the temple of Tibetan medicine. A hard school, this. I walked the miles as the day grew lighter, and at the gate leading to the entrance compound I met two others who also desired admission. We warily looked at each other, and I think that none of us was much impressed by what we saw in the others. We decided that we would have to be sociable if we were going to endure the same training. For some time we knocked timidly, and nothing happened. Then one of the others stooped and picked up a large stone, and really did make enough noise to attract attention. A monk appeared, waving a stick which to our frightened eyes looked as large as a young tree. "'What do you young devils want?' he exclaimed. "'Do you think I have nothing better to do than answer the door to such as you?' "'We want to be monks,' I replied. "'You look more like monkeys to me. "'Wait there and do not move. "'The master of the acolytes will see you when he is ready.' "'The door slammed shut, "'nearly knocking one of the other boys flat on his back. "'We sat upon the ground. "'Our legs were tired with standing. "'People came to the lamasary and went.' The pleasant smell of food was wafted to us through a small window, tantalizing us with the thought of satisfying our growing hunger. Food so near, yet so utterly unattainable. At last, the door was flung open with violence, and a tall, skinny man appeared in the opening. Well, he roared, what do you miserable scamps want? "'We want to be monks,' we said. "'Goodness me!' he exclaimed. "'What garbage is coming to the lamasary nowadays?' "'He beckoned us to enter the vast walled enclosure, "'which was the perimeter of the lamasary grounds. "'He asked us what we were, who we were, even why we were.' We gathered without difficulty that he was not at all impressed with us. To one, the son of a herdsman, he said, Enter quickly. If you can pass your test, you can stay. And to the next, You boy, what did you say? Son of a butcher? A cutter up of flesh? A transgressor of the laws of Buddha? And you come here? Be off with you quickly, or I will have you flogged around the road. The poor wretched boy forgot his tiredness in a sudden burst of speed as the monk lunged at him. Wheeling in a flash, he leaped forward, leaving little scuffs of disturbed dust as his feet touched the ground in his hurry. Now I was left, alone on my seventh birthday. The gaunt monk turned his fierce gaze in my direction, almost causing me to shrivel on the spot with fright. He twitched his stick menacingly. And you, what have we here? Oh, a young prince who wants to turn religious. We must see what you are made of first, my fine fellow. See what kind of stuffing you have. This is not the place for soft and pampered princelings. Take forty paces backwards and sit in the attitude of contemplation until I tell you otherwise, and do not move an eyelash. With that he turned abruptly and went away. Sadly I picked up my pathetic little bundle and took the forty steps back. On my knees I went, then sat cross-legged as commanded. So I sat throughout the day, unmoving. The dust blew against me, forming little mounds in the clips of my upturned hands, 
falling on my shoulders and lodging in my hair. As the sun began to fade, my hunger increased, and my throat was racked with the harshness of thirst, for I had had no food or drink since the first light of dawn. Passing monks, and there were many, took no heed. Wandering dogs paused a while to sniff curiously, then they too went away. A gang of small boys came past. One idly flipped a stone in my direction. It struck the side of my head and caused the blood to flow, but I did not stir. I was afraid to. If I had failed my endurance test, my father would not allow me to enter what had been my home. There was nowhere for me to go, nothing that I could do. I could only remain motionless, aching in every muscle, stiff in every joint. The sun hid behind the mountains, and the sky became dark. The stars shone bright against the blackness of the sky. From the lamasery windows, thousands of little butter lamps flickered into flame. A chill wind, the leaves of the willows hissed and rattled, and about me there were all the faint sounds which go to make the strange noises of the night. I still remained motionless for the strongest of reasons. I was too frightened to move, and I was very stiff. Presently came the soft swash swash of approaching monk's sandals slithering over the gritty way, the steps of an old man feeling his way in the darkness. A form loomed up before me, the form of an old monk bent and gnarled with the passage of austere years. His hands shook with age, a matter of some concern to me when I saw that he was spilling the tea he was carrying in one hand. In the other hand he held a small bowl of sampa. He passed them to me. At first I made no move to take them. Divining my thoughts, he said, Take them, my son, for you can move during the hours of darkness. So I drank the tea and transferred the sampa into my own bowl. The old monk said, Now sleep, but at the first rays of the sun take your stance here in the same position, for this is a test and is not the wanton cruelty which you may now consider it to be. Only those who pass this test can aspire to the higher ranks of our order. With that, he gathered up the cup and bowl and went away. I stood and stretched my legs, then lay down upon my side and finished the sampa. Now I was really tired, so scooping a depression in the ground to accommodate my hip bone and placing my spare robe beneath my head, I lay down. My seven years had not been easy years. At all times my father had been strict, frightfully strict, but even so, this was my first night away from home, and the whole day had been spent in one position, hungry, thirsty, and motionless. I had no idea of what the morrow would bring, or what more would be demanded of me, but now I had to sleep alone beneath the frosty sky, alone with my terror of the darkness, alone with my terror of the days to come. It seemed that I had hardly closed my eyes before the sound of a trumpet awakened me. Opening my eyes, I saw that it was the false dawn, with the first light of the approaching day reflected against the skies behind the mountains. Hurriedly, I sat up and resumed the position of contemplation. Gradually, the lamasery ahead of me awoke to life. First there had been the air of a sleeping town, a dead, inert hulk. 
Next the gentle sighing, as of a sleeper awakening. It grew to a murmur and developed to a deep hum, like the drone of bees on a hot summer's day. Occasionally there was the call of a trumpet, like the muted chirp of a distant bird, and the deep growl of a conch, like a bullfrog calling in a marsh. As the light increased, little groups of shaven heads passed and repassed behind the open windows. Windows, which in the earlier pre-dawn light had looked like the empty eye sockets of a clean-picked skull. The day grew older, and I grew stiffer, but I dared not move. I dared not fall asleep, for if I had moved and failed my test, then I had nowhere to go. Father had made it very clear that if the lamasery did not want me, then neither did he. Little groups of monks came out of the various buildings, going about their mysterious businesses. Small boys wandered round, sometimes kicking a shower of dust and small stones in my direction, or making ribald remarks. As there was no response from me, they soon tired of the abortive sport and went away in search of more cooperative victims. Gradually, as the light at eventide began to fail, the little butter lamps again flickered into life within the lamasery buildings. Soon the darkness was relieved merely by the faint star glow, for this was the time when the moon rose late. In our saying, the moon was now young and could not travel fast. I became sick with apprehension. Was I forgotten? Was this another test, one in which I had to be deprived of all food? Throughout the long day I had not steered, and now I was faint with hunger. Suddenly hope flared in me, and I almost jumped to my feet. There was a shuffling noise, and a dark outline approached. Then I saw that it was a very large black mastiff dragging something along. He took no notice of me, but went on his nocturnal mission, quite uncaring of my plight. My hopes fell. I could have wept. To prevent myself being so weak, I reminded myself that only girls and women were stupid as that. At last, I heard the old man approaching. This time he gazed more benignly upon me and said, Food and drink, my son, but the end is not yet. There is still tomorrow, so take care that you do not move, for so very many fail at the eleventh hour. With those words he turned and went away. While he was speaking I had drunk the tea, and again transferred the sampa into my own bowl. Again I lay down, certainly no happier than the night before. As I lay there I wondered at the injustice of it. I did not want to be a monk of any sect, shape, or size. I had no more choice than a pack animal being driven over a mountain pass. And so I fell asleep. The next day, the third day, as I sat in my attitude of contemplation, I could feel myself becoming weaker and giddy. The lamasery seemed to swim in a miasma compounded of buildings, bright-colored lights, purple patches, with mountains and monks liberally interspersed. With a determined effort, I managed to shake off the attack of vertigo. It really frightened me to think that I might fail now, after all the suffering I had had. By now the stones beneath me seemed to have grown knife edges, which chafed me in inconvenient places. 
In one of my later moments, I thought how glad I was that I was not a hen hatching eggs and compelled to sit even longer than I. The sun seemed to stand still. The day appeared endless, but at long last the light began to fail, and the evening wind commenced to play with a feather dropped by a passing bird. Once again the little lights appeared in the windows one by one. Hope I die tonight, I thought. I can't stick any more of this. Just then the tall figure of the master of the acolytes appeared in the distant doorway. Boy, come here, he called. Trying to rise with my stiffened legs, I pitched forward onto my face. Boy, if you want a rest, you can stay there another night. I shall not wait longer. Hastily, I grabbed my bundle and tottered towards him. Enter, he said, and attend evening service, then see me in the morning. It was warm inside, and there was a comforting smell of incense. My hunger-sharpened senses told me there was food quite near, so I followed a crowd moving to the right. Food, sampa, buttered tea... I edged my way to the front row as if I had a lifetime of practice. Monks made ineffectual grabs at my pigtail as I scrambled between their legs, but I was after food, and nothing was going to stop me now. Feeling a little better with some food inside me, I followed the crowd to the inner temple and the evening service. I was too tired to know anything about it, but no one took any notice of me. As the monks filed out, I slipped behind a giant pillar and stretched out on the stone floor with my bundle beneath my head. I slept. A stunning crash! I thought my head had split, and the sound of voices, New boy! One of the highborn! Come on, let's scrag him. One of the crowd of acolytes was waving my spare robe, which he had pulled from under my head. Another had my felt boots. A soft, squashy mass of Zampa caught me in the face. Blows and kicks were rained upon me, but I did not resist, thinking it might be part of the test to see if I obeyed the sixteenth of the laws, which ordered... Bear suffering and distress with patience and meekness. There was a sudden loud bellow. What's going on here? A frightened whisper. Oh, it's old rattlebones on the prowl. As I clawed the sampa from my eyes, the master of the acolytes reached down and dragged me to my feet by my pigtail. Softly, weakling, you, one of the future leaders, bah, take that and that. Blows, hard ones, absolutely showered upon me. Worthless weakling, can't even defend yourself. The blows seem non-ending. I fancied I heard old Sue's farewell saying, Acquit yourself well, remember all I have taught you. Unthinkingly, I turned and applied a little pressure, as Sue had taught me. The master was caught by surprise, and with a gasp of pain, he flew over my head, hit the stone floor, and skidded along on his nose, taking all the skin off, and coming to rest when his head hit a stone pillar with a loud onk. Death for me, I thought. This is the end of all my worries. The world seemed to stand still. The other boys were holding their breath. With a loud roar, the tall, bony monk leapt to his feet, blood streaming down his nose. He was roaring all light, roaring with laughter. Young gamecock, eh? 
cornered rat which ah uh, that's what we must find out turning and pointing to a tall ungainly boy of fourteen he said you nawang you are the biggest bully in this lamasary see if the son of a yak driver is better than the son of a prince when it comes to fighting for the first time i was grateful to tsu the old police monk in his younger days he had been a champion judo expert of cam he had taught me as he said all he knew i had had to fight with fully grown men and in this science where strength or age does not count i had become very proficient indeed now that i knew that my future depended on the result of this fight i was at last quite happy nawang was a strong and well-built boy but very ungainly in his movements i could see that he was used to rough and tumble fighting where his strength was in his favor he rushed at me intending to grip me and make me helpless i was not frightened now thanks to tsu and his at times brutal training as the wang rushed i moved aside and lightly twisted his arm his feet skidded from under him he turned a half circle and landed on his head for a moment he lay groaning then sprang to his feet and leapt at me i sank to the ground and twisted a leg as he passed over me this time he spun around and landed on his left shoulder still he was not satisfied he circled warily then jumped aside and grasped the heavy incense burner which he swung at me by its chains such a weapon is slow cumbersome and very easy to avoid i stepped beneath his flailing arms and lightly stabbed a finger to the base of his neck as tsu had so often showed me down he went like a rock on a mountain side his nerveless fingers relinquishing their grip on the chains and causing the censer to plummet like a slingshot at the group of watching boys and monks the wang was unconscious for about half an hour that special touch is often used to free the spirit from the body for astral traveling and similar purposes note the tibetan system is different and more advanced but i shall call it judo in this book as the tibetan name would convey nothing to western readers the master of the acolytes stepped forward toward me gave me a slap on the back which almost sent me flat in my face and made the somewhat contradictory statement boy you are a man my greatly daring reply was then have i earned some food sir please i have had very little of late my boy eat and drink your fill then tell one of these hooligans you are their master now to show you to me the old monk who had brought me food before i entered the lamasary came and spoke to me my son you have done well now wang was the bully of the acolytes now you take his place and control with kindness and compassion you have been taught well see that your knowledge is used well and does not fall into the wrong hands now come with me and i will get you food and drink the master of the acolytes greeted me amiably when i went to his room sit boy sit i am going to see if your educational prowess is as good as your physical i am going to try to catch you boy so watch out 
He asked me an amazing number of questions, some oral and some written. For six hours we sat opposite each other on our cushions. Then he expressed himself as satisfied. I felt like a badly tanned yak hide, soggy and limp. He stood up. Boy, he said, follow me. I am going to take you to the Lord Abbot. An unusual honor, but you will learn why. Come. Through the wide quarters I followed him, past the religious offices, past the inner temples and the schoolrooms, up the stairs, through more winding corridors, past the Hall of the Gods and the storage place of herbs, up more stairs, until at last we emerged on the flat roof, and I walked towards the Lord Abbot's house, which was built upon it. Then, through the gold-panelled doorway, past the golden Buddha, round by the symbol of medicine, and into the Lord Abbot's private room. Bow, boy, bow, and do as I do. Lord, here is the boy Tuesday loves Angrampa. With that, the master of the acolytes bowed three times, then prostrated himself upon the floor. I did the same, panting with eagerness to do the right thing in the right way. The impassive Lord Abbot looked at us and said, Sit. We sat upon cushions, cross-legged in the Tibetan way. For a long time, the Lord Abbot remained looking at me, but not speaking. Then he said, Tuesday, love, sang Rampa, I know all about you, all that has been predicted. Your trial of endurance has been harsh, but with good reason. That reason you will know in later years. Know now that of every thousand monks, only one is fitted for higher things, for higher development. The others drift and do their daily task. They are the manual workers, those who turn the prayer wheels without ever wondering why. We are not short of them. We are short of those who will carry on our knowledge when later our country is under an alien cloud. You will be specially trained intensively trained, and in a few short years you will be given more knowledge than a lama normally acquires in a long lifetime. The way will be hard, and often it will be painful. To force clairvoyance is painful, and to travel in the astral planes requires nerves that nothing can shatter, and a determination as hard as the rocks. I listened hard, taking it all in. It all seemed too difficult for me. I was not that energetic. He went on. You will be trained here in medicine and in astrology. You will be given every assistance which we can render. You will also be trained in the esoteric arts. Your path is mapped for you, Tuesday Love sang Rampa. Although you are but seven years of age, I speak to you as a man, for thus you have been brought up. He inclined his head, and the master of the acolytes rose and bowed deeply. I did the same, and together we made our way out. Not until we were again in the master's room did he break the silence. Boy, you will have to work hard all the time, but we will help you all we can. Now I will have you taken to get your head shaved. In Tibet, when a boy enters the priesthood, his head is shaved with the exception of one lock. 
This lock is removed when the boy is given the priest name and his former name is discarded, but more of that a little further on. The master of acolytes led me through winding ways to a small room, the barber shop. Here I was told to sit on the floor. Tam Cho, the master said, shave this boy's head. Remove the name lock as well, for he is being given his name immediately. Tam Cho stepped forward, grasped my pigtail in his right hand, and lifted it straight up. Ah, my boy, lovely pigtail, well buttered, well cared for, a pleasure to saw it off. From somewhere he produced a huge pair of shears, the sort our servants used for cutting plants. Tish, he roared, come and hold up this end of the rope. Tish, the assistant, came running forward and held up my pigtail so tightly that I was almost lifted off the ground. With his tongue protruding and with many little grunts, Tam Cho manipulated those deplorably blunt shears until my pigtail was severed. And this was just the start. The assistant brought a bowl of hot water, so hot that I jumped off the floor in anguish when it was poured on my head. What's the matter, boy? Being boiled? I replied that I was, and he said, Never mind that. It makes the hair easier to remove. He took up a three-sided razor, very like the thing we had at home for scraping floors. Eventually, after an eternity, it seemed to me, my head was denuded of hair. Come with me, said the master. He led me to his room and produced a big book. Now, what are we to call you? He went on mumbling to himself, and then, Aha! Here we are. From now on, you will be called Ya Meg Dar La Lu. For this book, however, I shall continue to use the name of Tuesday Love Sang Rampa, as it is easier for the reader. Feeling as naked as a new laid egg, I was taken to a class. Having had such a good education at home, I was considered to know more than the average, so was put in the class of the seventeen-year-old acolytes. I felt like a dwarf among giants. The others had seen how I handled Nwang, so I had no trouble except for the incident of one big stupid boy. He came up behind me and put his dirty great hands on my very sore head. It was just a matter of reaching up and jabbing my fingers into the ends of his elbows to send him away screaming with pain. Try knocking two funny bones at once and see. Tzu really taught me well. The judo instructors whom I was to meet later in the week all knew Tzu. All said he was the finest judo adept in the whole of Tibet. I had no more trouble from boys. Our teacher, who had had his back turned when the boy put his hands on my head, had soon noticed what was happening. He laughed so much at the result that he let us go early. It was now about 8.30 in the evening, so we had about three-quarters of an hour to spare before temple service at 9.15. My joy was short-lived. As we were leaving the room, a lama beckoned to me. I went to him, and he said, Come with me. I followed him, wondering what fresh trouble was in store. He turned into a music room, where there were about twenty boys, who I knew to be entrants like myself. Three musicians sat at their instruments, one at a drum, one at a conch, and the other a silver trumpet. 
the Lama said, We will sing so that I may test your voices for the choir. The musician started playing a very well-known air which everybody could sing. We raised our voices. The music master raised his eyebrows. The puzzled look on his face was replaced by one of real pain. He up went his two hands in protest. Stop, stop, he shouted. Even the gods must writhe at this. Now start again and do it properly. We started again. Again we were stopped. This time the music master came straight to me. Dolt, he explained, you are trying to make fun of me. We will have the musicians play, and you sing alone, as you will not sing in company. Once again the music started. Once again I raised my voice in song, but not for long. The music master waved to me in a frenzy. Tuesday, Lob sang, your talents do not include music. Never in my fifty-five years here have I heard such an off-key voice. Off-key? It's no key at all. Boy, you will not sing again. In the singing sessions, you will study other things. In the temple services, you will not sing, or your disharmony will ruin all. Now go, you unmusical vandal. I went. I idled around until I heard the trumpets announcing that it was time to assemble for the last service. Last night, good gracious, was it only last night that I had entered the lamissary? It seemed ages. I felt that I was walking in my sleep, and I was hungry again. Perhaps that was just as well. If I had been full, I should have dropped off to sleep. Someone grabbed my robe, and I was swung up in the air. A huge, friendly-looking llama had hoisted me up to his broad shoulder. Come on, boy, you'll be late for service, and then you'll catch it. You miss your supper, you know, if you are late, and you feel as empty as a drum. He entered the temple, still carrying me, and took his place just at the back of the boy's cushions. Carefully, he placed me on a cushion in front of him. Face me, boy, and make the same responses as I do, but when I sing, you keep quiet. I was indeed grateful for his help. So few people had ever been kind to me. Instruction I had had in the past had been yelled in one end or knocked in the other end. I must have dozed off because I came to with a start to find that the service had ended and the big llama had carried me, asleep, to the refractory and put tea, sampa, and some boiled vegetables in front of me. Eat it up, boy, and then get off to bed. I'll show you where to sleep. For this night you can sleep until five in the morning. Then come to me. That is the last thing I heard, until at five in the morning I was awakened, with difficulty, by a boy who had been friendly the day before. I saw that I was in a large room and was resting on three cushions. The Lama Mingyar donned up told me to see that you were awakened at five. Up I got and piled my cushions against a wall as I saw the others had done. The others were moving out and the boy with me said, We must hurry for breakfast. Then I have to take you to the Lama Mingyard on top. Now I was becoming more settled. Not that I liked the place or I wanted to stay, but it did occur to me that as I had no choice whatever, I should be my own best friend if I settled without any fuss. At breakfast the reader was droning out something from one of the hundred and twelve volumes of the Kang Yur, the Buddhist scriptures. 
He must have seen that I was thinking of something else, for he rapped out, You, small new boy there, what did I say last? Quick like a flash, and quite without thinking, I replied, Sir, you said that boy is not listening. I'll catch him. That certainly raised a laugh and saved me from a hiding for inattention. The reader smiled, a rare event, and explained that he had asked for the text from the scriptures, but I could get away with it this time. At all meals, readers stand at a lectern and read from sacred books. Monks are not allowed to talk at meals, nor to think of food. They must ingest sacred knowledge with their food. We all sat on the floor, on cushions, and ate from a table which was about eighteen inches high. We were not permitted to make any noise at meal times, and we were absolutely banned from resting our elbows on the table. The discipline at Chakpori was indeed iron. Chakpori means Iron Mountain. In most lamasaries, there was little organized discipline or routine. Monks could work or laze as they pleased. Perhaps one in a thousand wanted to make progress, and they were the ones who became lamas, for lama means superior one, and is not applied to all and sundry. In our lamasari, the discipline was strict even fiercely so. We were going to be specialists, leaders of our class, and for us, order and training was considered to be utterly essential. We boys were not allowed to use the normal white robes of an acolyte, but had to wear the russet of the accepted monk. We had domestic workers as well, but these monks were servant monks who saw to the housekeeping side of the lamasery. We had to take turns at domestic work to make sure that we did not get exalted ideas. We always had to remember the old Buddhist saying, Be yourself the example, do only good and no harm to others. This is the essence of Buddha's teaching. Our Lord Abbot, the Lama Shampala, was as strict as my father and demanded instant obedience. One of his sayings was, Reading and writing are the gates of all qualities. So we got plenty to do in that line. Chapter 5 Life as a cella. Our day started at midnight at Chakpori. As the midnight trumpet sounded, echoing through the dimly lit corridors, we would roll sleepily off our bed cushions and fumble in the darkness for our robes. We all slept in the nude, the usual system in Tibet where there is no false modesty. With our robes on, off we would go, tucking our belongings into the pouched-up front of our dress. Down the passageways we would clatter, not in a good mood at that hour. Part of our teaching was, It is better to rest with a peaceful mind than to sit like Buddha and pray when angry. My irreverent thought often was, well, why can't we rest with a peaceful mind? This midnight stunt makes me angry. But no one gave me a satisfactory answer, and I had to go with the others into the prayer hall. Here the innumerable butter lamps struggled to shed their rays of light through the drifting clouds of incense smoke. In the flickering light, with the shifting shadows, the giant sacred figures seemed to become alive, to bow and sway in response to our chants. 
The hundreds of monks and boys would sit cross-legged on cushions on the floor. All would sit in rows the length of the hall. Each pair or rows would face each other so that the first and second rows would be face to face. The second and third would be back to back, and so on. We would have our chants and sacred songs, which employ special tonal scales, because in the East it is realized that sounds have power. Just as a musical note can shatter a glass, so can a combination of notes build up metaphysical power. There would also be readings from the Kang Yir. It was a most impressive sight to see these hundreds of men in blood-red robes and golden stoles swaying and chanting in unison with the silver tinkle of little bells and the throbbing of drums. Blue clouds of incense smoke coiled and wreathed about the knees of the gods and every so often it seemed in the uncertain light that one or other of the figures was gazing straight at us. The service would last about an hour and then we would return to our sleeping cushions until four in the morning. Another service would start at about 4.15. At five we would have our first meal of sampa and buttered tea. Even at this meal, the reader would be droning out his words, and the disciplinarian would be watchful at his side. At this meal, any special orders or information would be given. It might be that something was wanted from Lhasa, and then at the breakfast meal the names of the monks would be called, those who were going to take or collect the goods. They would also be given special dispensation to be away from the lamasery for such and such a time, and to miss a certain number of services. At six o'clock we would be assembled in our classrooms ready for the first sessions of our studies. The second of our Tibetan laws was, You shall perform religious observances and study. In my seven-year-old ignorance, I could not understand why we had to obey that law when the fifth law, you shall honor your elders and those of high birth, was flaunted and broken. All my experience had led me to believe that there was something shameful in being of high birth. Certainly I had been victimized for it. It did not occur to me then that it was not the rank of birth that matters but the character of the person concerned. We attended another service at nine in the morning, interrupting our studies for about forty minutes. Quite a welcome break sometimes, but we had to be in class again by a quarter to ten. A different subject was started then, and we had to work at it until one o'clock. Still, we were not free to eat. A half-hour service came first, and then we had our buttered tea and sampa. One hour of manual labor followed to give us exercise and to teach us humility. I seemed more often than not to collect the messiest of the most unpleasant type of job. Three o'clock saw us trooping off for an hour of enforced rest. We were not allowed to talk or move, but just to lie still. This was not a popular time, because the hour was too short for a sleep, but too long to stay idle we could think of much better things to do. At four, after this rest, we returned to our studies. This was the dread period of the day, five hours without a break, 
five hours when we could not leave the room for anything without incurring the severest penalties. Our teachers were quite free with their stout canes, and some of them tackled the punishment of offenders with real enthusiasm. Only the badly pressed or most foolhardy pupils asked to be excused when punishment on one's return was inevitable. Our release came at nine o'clock when we had the last meal of the day. Again, this was buttered tea and sampa. Sometimes, only sometimes, we had vegetables. Usually that meant sliced turnips or some very small beans. They were raw, but to hungry boys they were very acceptable. On one unforgettable occasion, when I was eight, we had some pickled walnuts. I was particularly fond of them, having had them often at home. Now, foolishly, I tried to work an exchange with another boy. He to have my spare robe in exchange for his pickled walnuts. The disciplinarian heard, and I was called to the middle of the hall and made to confess my sin. As a punishment for greediness, I had to remain without food or drink for twenty-four hours. My spare robe was taken from me, as it was said that I had no use for it, having been willing to barter it for that which was not essential. At nine thirty, we went to our sleeping cushions, bed to us. No one was late for bed. I thought the long hours would kill me. I thought that I should drop dead at any moment, or that I would fall asleep and never awaken again. At first, I and the other new boys used to hide in corners for a good doze. After quite a short time, I became used to the long hours and took no notice at all of the length of the day. It was just before six in the morning when, with the help of the boy who had awakened me, I found myself in front of the Lama Mingyar Dondup's door. Although I had not knocked, he called for me to enter. His room was a very pleasant one, and there were wonderful paintings on the wall, some of them actually painted on the walls, and others painted on silk and hanging. A few small statuettes were on low tables. They were of gods and goddesses, and were made of jade, gold, and cloisonne. A large wheel of life also hung upon the wall. The lama was sitting in the lotus attitude on his cushion, and before him, on a low table, he had a number of books, one of which he was studying as I entered. Sit here with me, love sang. We have a lot of things to discuss together. But first, an important question to a growing man. Have you had enough to eat and drink? I assured him that I had. The Lord Abbot has said that we can work together. We have traced your previous incarnation, and it was a good one. Now we want to redevelop certain powers and abilities you then had. In the space of a very few years, we want you to have more knowledge than a lama has in a very long life. He paused and looked at me long and hard. His eyes were very piercing. All men must be free to choose their own path, he continued. Your way will be hard for forty years if you take the right path, but it will lead to great benefits in the next life. The wrong path now will give you comforts, softness, and riches in this life, but you will not develop. 
You and you alone can choose. He stopped and looked at me. Sir, I replied, my father told me that if I failed at the lamasary, I was not to return home. How then would I have softness and comfort if I had no home to which to return? And who would show me the right path if I choose it? He smiled at me and answered, Have you already forgotten? We have traced your previous incarnation. If you choose the wrong path, the path of softness, you will be installed in the lamasary as a living incarnation, and in a very few years you will be an abbot in charge. Your father would not call that failure. Something in the way he spoke made me ask a further question. Would you consider it a failure? Yes, he replied. Knowing what I know, I would call it a failure. And who will show me the way? I will be your guide if you take the right path, but you are the one to choose. No one can influence your decision. I looked at him, stared at him, and liked what I saw a big man with keen black eyes, a broad open face and a high forehead. Yes, I liked what I saw. Although only seven years of age, I had had a hard life and met many people and really could judge if a man was good. Sir, I said, I would like to be your pupil and take the right path. I added somewhat ruefully, I suppose, but I still don't like hard work. He laughed, and his laugh was deep and warming. Love sang, love sang. None of us really like hard work, but few of us are truthful enough to admit it. He looked through his papers. We shall need to do a little operation to your head soon to force clairvoyance, and then we will speed your studies hypnotically. We are going to take you far in metaphysics as well as in medicine. I felt a bit gloomy, more hard work. It seemed to me that I had had to work hard all my seven years, and there seemed to be little play or kite flying. The Lama seemed to know my thoughts. Oh, yes, young man, there will be much kite flying later, the real thing, man lefters. But first, we must map out how best to arrange these studies. He turned to his papers and riffled through them. Let me see, nine o'clock until one. Yes, that will do for a start. Come here every day at nine instead of attending service, and we will see what interesting things we can discuss. Starting from tomorrow, have you any message for your father and mother? I'm seeing them today, giving them your pigtail. I was quite overcome. When a boy was accepted by a lamasary, his pigtail was cut off and his head shaved. The pigtail would be sent to the parents, carried by a small acolyte as a symbol that their son had been accepted. Now the Lama Mingyar donned up was taking my pigtail to deliver in person. That meant he had accepted me as his own personal charge, as his spiritual son. This Lama was a very important man, a very clever man, one who had a most enviable reputation throughout Tibet. I knew that I could not fail under such a man. That morning, back in the classroom, I was a most 
inattentive pupil. My thoughts were elsewhere, and the teacher had ample time and opportunity to satisfy his joy in punishing at least one small boy. It all seemed very hard, the severity of the teachers, but then I consoled myself. That is why I came to learn. That is why I reincarnated, although then I did not remember what it was that I had to relearn. We firmly believe in reincarnation in Tibet. We believe that when one reaches a certain advanced stage of evolution, one can choose to go on to another plane of existence or return to earth to learn something more or to help others. It may be that a wise man had a certain mission in life but died before he could complete his work. In that case, so we believe, he can return to complete his task, providing that the result will be of benefit to others. Very few people could have their previous incarnations traced back. There had to be certain signs, and the cost and time would prohibit it. Those who had those signs, as I had, were termed living incarnations. They were subjected to the sternest of stern treatment when they were young, as I had been, but became objects of reverence when they became older. In my case, I was going to have special treatment to force-feed my occult knowledge. Why, I did not know, then. A rain of blows on my shoulders brought me back to the reality of the classroom with a violent jerk. Fool, dolt, imbecile, have the mind demons penetrated your thick skull? It is more than I could do. You are fortunate that it is now time to attend service. With that remark, the enraged teacher gave me a final hearty blow for good measure and stalked out of the room. The boy next to me said, Don't forget, it's our turn to work in the kitchen this afternoon. Hope we will get a chance to fill our Sampa bags. Kitchen work was hard. The regulars there used to treat us boys as slaves. There was no hour of rest for us after kitchen hour. Two solid hours of hard labor, then straight to the classroom again. Sometimes we would be kept later in the kitchens and so be late for class. A fuming teacher would be waiting for us and would lay about him with his stick without giving us any opportunity of explaining the reason. My first day of work in the kitchen was nearly my last. We trooped reluctantly along the stone flag corridors towards the kitchens. At the door we were met by an angry monk. Come on, you lazy, useless rascals, he shouted. The first ten of you, get in there and stoke the fires. I was the tenth. Down another flight of steps we went. The heat was overpowering. In front of us we saw a ruddy light, the light of roaring fires. Huge piles of yak dung lay about. This was the fuel for the furnaces. Get those iron scoops and stoke for your lives, the monk in charge yelled. I was just a poor seven-year-old among the others of my class, among whom was none younger than seventeen. I could barely lift the scoop, and in straining to put the fuel in the fire, I tipped it over the monk's feet. With a roar of rage, he seized me by the throat, swung me round, and tripped. I was sent flying backwards. A terrible pain shot through me, and there was the sickening smell of burning flesh. I had fallen against the red-hot end of a bar protruding from the furnace. I fell with a scream to the floor among the hot ashes. 
At the top of my left leg, almost at the leg joint, the bar had burned its way in until stopped by the bone. I still have the dead white scar, which even now causes me some trouble. By this scar I was in later years to be identified by the Japanese. There was uproar. Monks came rushing from everywhere. I was still among the hot ashes, but was soon lifted out. Quite a lot of my body had superficial burns, but the leg burn really was serious. Quickly I was carried upstairs to a lama. He was a medical lama, and applied himself to the task of saving my leg. The iron had been rusty, and when it entered my leg, flakes of rust had remained behind. He had to probe around and scoop out the pieces until the wound was clean. Then it was tightly packed with a powdered herb compress. The rest of my body was dabbed with an herbal lotion, which certainly eased the pain of the fire. My leg was throbbing and throbbing, and I was sure that I would never walk again. When he had finished, the lama called a monk to carry me to a small side room, where I was put to bed on cushions. An old monk came in and sat on the floor beside me and started muttering prayers over me. I thought to myself that it was a fine thing to offer prayers for my safety after the accident had happened. I also decided to lead a good life as I now had personal experience of what it felt like when the fire devils tormented me. I thought of a picture I had seen in which a devil was prodding an unfortunate victim in much the same place as I had been burned. It may be thought that monks were terrible people, not at all what one would expect. But, monks, what does it mean? We understand that word as anyone, male, living in the lamastic service not necessarily a religious person. In Tibet, almost anyone can become a monk. Often a boy is sent to be a monk without having any choice at all in the matter. Or a man may decide that he's had enough of sheep herding and wants to be sure of a roof over his head when the temperature is 40 below zero. He becomes a monk not through religious convictions, but for his own creature comfort. The Lamasari had monks as their domestic staff, as their builders, laborers, and scavengers. In other parts of the world they would be termed servants, or the equivalent. Most of them had had a hard time. Life at twelve to twenty thousand feet can be difficult, and often they were hard on us boys just for sheer want of thought or feeling. To us the term monk was synonymous with man. We named the members of the priesthood quite differently. A cella was a boy pupil, a novice, or an acolyte. Nearest to what the average man means by monk is trappa, he is the most numerous of those in a lamasari. Then we come to that most abused term, a uh, lama. If the trappas are the non-commissioned soldiers, then the lama is the commissioned officer. Judging by the way most people in the West talk or write, there are more officers than men. Lamas are masters, gurus as we term them. The Lama Mingyar Dandap was going to be my guru and I his cella. After the Lamas there were the abbots. Not all of them were in charge of Lamasaris. Many were engaged in the general duties of senior administration or traveling from Lamasari to Lamasari. 
In some instances, a particular lama could be of higher status than an abbot. It depended upon what he was doing. Those who were living incarnations, such as I had been proved, could be made abbots at the age of fourteen. It depended upon whether they could pass the severe examinations. These groups were strict and stern, but they were not cruel. They were at all times just. A further example of monks can be seen in the term police monks. Their sole purpose was to keep order. They were not concerned with the temple ceremonial, except that they had to be present to make sure that everything was orderly. The police monks were often cruel, and as stated, so were the domestic staff. One could not condemn a bishop because his undergardener misbehaved, nor expect the undergardener to be a saint just because he worked for a bishop. In the Lamasary we had a prison, not by any means a pleasant place to be, but the characters of those who were consigned to it were not pleasant either. My solitary experience of it was when I had to treat a prisoner who had been taken ill. It was when I was almost ready to leave the Lamasary that I was called to the prison cell. Out in the back courtyard there were a number of circular parapets about three feet high. The massive stones forming them were as wide as they were high. Covering the tops were stone bars, each as thick as a man's thigh. They covered a circular opening about nine feet across. Four police monks grasped the center bar and dragged it aside. One stooped and picked up a yak hair rope, at the end of which there was a flimsy-looking loop. I looked on unhappily. Trust myself to that? Now, honorable medical lama, if you will step here and put your foot in this, we will lower you, said the man. Gloomily I complied. You will want a light, sir, the police monk said, and passed me a flaring torch made of yarn soaked in butter. My gloom increased. I had to hold on to the rope, hold on to the torch, and avoid setting myself on fire or burning through the thin little rope which so dubiously supported me. But down I went, twenty-five or thirty feet, down between walls glistening with water, down to the filthy stone floor. By the light of the torch I saw an evil-looking wretch crouched against the wall. Just one look was enough. There was no aura around him, so no life. I said a prayer for the soul wandering between the planes of existence, and closed the wild, staring eyes, then called to be pulled up. My work was finished now. The body-breakers would take over. I asked what had been his crime, and was told that he had been a wandering beggar who had come to the Lamasary for food and shelter, and then, in the night, killed a monk for his few possessions. He had been overtaken while escaping, and brought back to the scene of his crimes. But all that is somewhat of a digression from the incident of my first attempt at kitchen work. The effects of the cooling lotions were wearing off, and I felt as if the skin were being scorched off my body. The throbbing in my leg increased. It seemed as if it were going to explode. To my fevered imagination, the hole was filled with a flaming torch. Time dragged. Throughout the Lamasary there were sounds, some that I knew and many that I did not. 
The pain was sweeping up my body in great fiery gouts. I lay on my face, but the front of my body also was burned by the hot ashes. There was a faint rustle, and someone sat beside me. A kind, compassionate voice, the voice of the Lama, Mingyar Dondap, said, Little friend, it is too much sleep. Gentle fingers swept along my spine, again and again, and I knew no more. A pale sun was shining in my eyes. I blinked awake, and with the first returning consciousness thought that someone was kicking me, that I had overslept. I tried to jump up to attend service, but fell back in agony. My leg! A soothing voice spoke. Keep still, love sang. This is a day of rest for you. I turned my head stiffly and saw with great astonishment that I was in the Lama's room and that he was sitting beside me. He saw my look and smiled. And why the amazement? Is it not right that two friends should be together when one is sick? My somewhat faint reply was, but you are a head lama, and I am just a boy. Love sang, we have gone far together in other lives. In this, yet, you do not remember. I do. We were very close together in our last incarnations. But now, you must rest and regain your strength. We are going to save your leg for you, so do not worry. I thought of the wheel of existence. I thought of the injunction in our Buddhist scriptures, which says, The prosperity of the generous man never fails, while the miser finds no comforter. Let the powerful man be generous to the suppliant. Let him look down the long path of lives, for riches revolve like the wheels of a cart, they come now to one and now to another. The beggar today is a prince tomorrow, and the prince may become as a beggar. It was obvious to me, even then, that the Lama, who was now my guide, was indeed a good man, and one whom I would follow to the utmost of my ability. It was clear that he knew a very great deal about me, far more than I knew myself. I was looking forward to studying with him, and I resolved that no one should have a better pupil. There was, as I could plainly feel, a very strong affinity between us, and I marveled at the workings of fate which had placed me in his care. I turned my head to look out the window. My bed cushions had been placed on a table so that I could see out. It seemed very strange to be resting off the floor some four feet in the air. My childish fancy likened it to a bird roosting in a tree, but there was much to see. Far away, over the lower roofs beneath the window, I could see Lassa sprawled in the sunlight, little houses dwarfed by the distance, and all of delicate pastel shades. The meandering waters of the Key River flowed through the level valley, flanked by the greenest of green grass. In the distance the mountains were purple, surmounted with white caps of shining snow, and nearer mountain sides were speckled with golden roofed lamasaries. To the left was the Potala, with its immense bulk forming a small mountain. Slightly to the right of us was a small wood from which peeped temples and colleges. 
This was the home of the state oracle of Tibet, an important gentleman whose sole task in life is to connect the material world with the immaterial. Below in the forecourt, monks of all ranks were passing to and fro. Some wore a somber brown robe. These were the worker monks. A small group of boys were wearing white, student monks from some distant lamasari. Higher ranks were there too, those in blood red and those with purple robes. These latter often had golden stoles upon them, indicating that they were connected with the higher administration. A number were on horses or ponies. The laity rode colored animals, while the priests used only white. But all of this was taking me away from the immediate present. I was more concerned now about getting better and being able to move around again. After three days, it was thought better for me to get up and move around. My leg was very stiff and shockingly painful. The whole area was inflamed and there was much discharge caused by the particles of iron rust which had not been removed. As I could not walk unaided, a crutch was made and I hopped around on this with some resemblance to a wounded bird. My body still had a large number of burns and blisters from the hot ashes, but the whole lot together was not as painful as my leg. Sitting was impossible. I had to lie on my right side or on my face. Obviously I could not attend services or the classrooms, so my guide, the Lama Mingyar Dandap, taught me almost full time. He expressed himself as well satisfied with the amount I had learned in my few years, but said, A lot of this you have unconsciously remembered from your last incarnation. End of chapter 5